systematic theology. It was the Baptist confession of faith that came out of the Reformation. Um, it's what Charles Spurgeon used to teach and to educate his congregation, and it's a wonderful document. Uh, we, are, we are establishing theological building blocks as we go along, and so it's critical, you know, to understand from man's perspective the effects of sin. There's the age-old question that we need to be able to answer rightly from the scriptures, and that is, how is someone saved? How does someone obtain salvation? The question, for whom did Christ die? All these are so critical because in the scriptures, Matt has mentioned it, there is a tension between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And this chapter in particular, free will, uh, man's will, teaches us much about where man is and how he comes to faith. So we're gonna cover the entire five paragraphs this morning. And if I had one set of verses that described this topic, it would be in John, the Gospel of John, in the prologue, John 1, you turn with me there, John 1, verses 12 and 13. Oftentimes, we see verse 12 in a track, a gospel track that is passed out. But what's interesting is, is at the end of verse 12, there's not a period, there's a comma the thought continues. So read it with me. But as many as receive him, Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. It continues. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, i.e. man in all his efforts cannot attain to this. But look at the last three words. But of God. Man has to be born again, born from above, born of God in order to receive salvation. And so, there's this tension between the responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God in salvation. So let's look at these paragraphs. Paragraph one is the definition of the will of man, okay? God has endued the will of man with that natural liberty and power of acting upon choice, that it is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined or compelled to do good or evil. We are not robots. Even if you parked out to the right at the end of church, you could walk out here by your choice and turn to the left. When you go to lunch and they pl place a menu, you don't have to order the hamburger, you could order the chicken nuggets. You have the ability, God has given you a reasonable mind to make choices. And you are not forced to make a choice that your nature doesn't want you to make. Does that make sense? We're, we, that is what God has given us and how he has created us. Man does what he wants to do but here's the question, why does he do what he wants to do? And we'll answer that question, and all of a sudden the lights got much brighter. <clears throat> That's what I wanted, the spotlight. All right, so let's turn to Matthew chapter 17. They knew I wanted the attention. <clears throat> 
Again, this is so critical in our understanding of who God is and what he has done for his people. Jesus is talking about John the Baptist and Elijah. And Elijah must come first. And in verse 11 of Matthew 17, and he, Jesus, answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things but I say to you that Elijah has already come in the person and work of John the Baptist. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. And that's why the authors of the confession have brought us here. They did to John, the Pharisees, the religious leader, the Jews, did to John the Baptist, the, the Gentiles, they did to him whatever they wished, and then he foreshadows what's gonna happen to himself. He says, so also the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's speaking, is going to suffer at their hands, i.e., should I release him, crucify him? The crowd cried out, crucified him, crucify him. They had a chance to release him. They did to him what they wanted to do, James. Go to James chapter one. <clears throat> Man has a will and can make the choices that he wants to make according to his nature. James one, verse 13. I feel like I'm at a disco. <laughs> If the Bee Gees start playing, I'm gonna cancel church. <clears throat> Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust i.e., man sins because he wants to sin, he has a sin nature, and he is born into sin. See Psalm 51. Man sins because he wants to sin. Verse 15. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Man, but that's, what, that's the choice that man wants to make. I taught, I don't know, a couple months ago, and I made the statement that the sinner does not struggle with sin. And somebody, and, and, and I, I use the expression, it's like you've got, CC, you're, you've got $6 in your pocket, and you're at CC's Pizza, and it's a buffet, it's all you can eat. There's never enough. And somebody came up to me and challenged me on that, and they had a very valid point. Man does have a governor to his sin, it's his conscience. Man intuitively knows what is right and wrong. When you come to the stop sign, you know that you're supposed to stop. You know that killing someone is wrong. But what happens over time, as you continue to sin, if you are not born again, if you do not have the Spirit of God residing within you, your conscience becomes seared. And when it becomes seared, it becomes less sensitive. And it's almost like things speed up in the sin because you become less sensitive to it and almost to, you almost do more. It's almost like drinking one cup of coffee and then needing two cups of coffee. Does that make sense? So, just as a point of clarification, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Moses is at the end of his life, and he puts before Israel the choice to follow God or to reject him. Deuteronomy 30, I'm gonna start in verse 15. <clears throat> Moses says, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. 
in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land when, where you are crossing the Jordan to enter in and possess it, to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse, so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God and by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him, for this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give to them. Moses is telling the people Choose life, choose God, or reject him and choose death. Now again, I've said it, I've I've made a prelude that man does according to his nature. How is the story gonna end? Go to chapter 31. The Lord knows how it's gonna end. He knows, as David says, before a word is on my mouth, O Lord, you know it. So in verse 15, Deuteronomy 31, 15, Moses writes, and the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood at the doorway of the tent, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers, i.e. die, and this people will arise and play the harlot with the strange gods of the land in the midst of which they are going and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them, hide my face from them and they shall be consumed and many evils and troubles shall come upon them so that they will say in that day, is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us. Man is free to act according to his nature, but the Lord knows the nature. And he says they're gonna fall away. They're a stiff-necked people. They're gonna reject me. That is the will of man defined, paragraph two. Paragraph two is pre-fall. It's in the garden before Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the innocency of Adam. This is before he sinned. The confession says, man in his state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet was unstable. His will could change, it was mutable. God is immutable, man had a will that was pliable, unstable, but yet was unstable so that he might fall from it. Adam, unlike us, was not from the hand of God born into sin. He stood in a state that was somewhat neutral. He could be obedient to God and keep the one God, command that God gave in the garden, or he could reject God's word and do what he wanted to do. He was wholly different from us because he came from the hand of God upright, without sin. You and I come from our mother's womb in sin. Again, see Psalm 51. So let's go to Ecclesiastes 7. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 7.29, 
we've referenced this verse before. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, righteous, clean, without sin. I have man, made man spiritually upright, but they have sought out many devices. They've sought out sin, they've rejected God's word, we saw that in the fall. I'm not gonna go there for the sake of time. Genesis three, the woman saw that the food was good to eat, pleasurable to the eyes, so she take and ate of it. She gave to Adam, he ate, and then they realized that they were naked. They had shame. They had their everything in their relationship at that moment with God changed because they took God's word and they put their word and their will above it. They rejected it. God made man upright, but he sinned, he fell. Paragraph three. This would be the doctrine of total inability. Total spiritual inability. And that is a direct result of the doctrine of total depravity. Not that you are going to kill 14 people on the way home today, that you are as bad as you possibly could be, but every molecule of your being has been affected by the fall. You, as a sinner, are totally depraved, and your depravity has made you unable, total inability. This is what the paragraph says. This is so important to understanding how someone comes to faith. Man, <clears throat> by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse or opposed from that, that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. Sin has left man with no ability in and of himself to turn to God. And you say, well, okay, all right, well, I don't know if that's my experience. I was at church, somebody told me about Christ, and they told me that the response of the gospel was to believe, and I believed. I repented to my sins, I turned to Christ, and now I am one of his children. I know that I'm one of his children. Well, that's only happened because God regenerated your heart. He gave you spiritual ears to hear the gospel. He gave you the spiritual equipment that you did not have to receive spiritual words, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave you the gift of faith and repentance and you exercised it. Yes, you believed because God changed you first. Yes, you came because God drew you first. Because in and of yourself, you do not have the ability to turn yourself to God. You know, it, it, the beautiful picture is the man with the withered hand. The Lord Jesus Christ looks at him and says, stretch out your hand. That was the very thing he couldn't do. His hand wasn't whole. In and of himself, he couldn't do that. But God made him able. Salvation is of the Lord. The Lord provided. He was able to stretch out his hand because the Lord gave him the ability to do that. 
the Lord restored him. It's Ezekiel 36. I will take out your heart of flesh, your heart of stone, and I will put a heart of flesh in you. I will put my spirit within you, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's for ethnic Israel, but that's a picture of regeneration. Man is, in and of himself, unable. Romans 5. We could go to Romans 3. There's none who turns to God. There's there's no one who seeks after God. Romans 5. When did Christ die for you? Verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. Paul writes, he writes of our spiritual condition. For while we were still helpless, unable, inability, spiritually. For why we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ didn't die for you because you were good. There is no pride We're gonna sing it this morning. I I glory in my Redeemer. Our pride and our boast and our glory is in what God has done for us, not in and of ourselves. There is no pride in salvation except for God. Verse eight. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... What does sin mean? What does the word sin mean? It means to miss the mark. It's literally a picture of an arrow, an archer, shooting at a target and missing the target. We have missed God's target. We have not met God's standard. We're sinners. While we were yet sinners, while we missed the mark, while we did not do what what the requirement is, Christ died for us. Chapter eight, it gets painfully clear. There's a contrast that Paul is writing between the natural man, what we are naturally from the, the womb, and the regenerated man, the new man, the person in Christ. Verse five. For those who are according to the flesh, that's the natural man, that's the unregenerate man, sets their minds on the things of the flesh, but those are according to the spirit, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. The natural man focuses on the flesh. The Regenerated man has the ability, not always, to focus on the things of God because they have the Spirit of God within them. Verse six, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. That word hostile means at war with God. The natural man is shaking his fist in God's face saying, you are not going to be the captain of my destiny. That's where we are naturally. But the mind set on the flesh, verse seven, is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. That is total inability. The natural man cannot please God. We could go to Isaiah 64, verse six. All your good works in the flesh are what Isaiah calls filthy rags. Can natural people, naturally in their sins, can the natural man do things that are good? Well, God can use it for his good and for his plan, but it isn't gonna be for their good. 
if the richest man in the world gave all his money away to philanthropy, to the church, whatever, God would use that? But God is not a debtor to anybody. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That man is not going to, or woman is not going to earn any brownie points with God. They are doing what they're doing out of a man-made religion. They're trying to earn their way of salvation. God doesn't owe us anything. That's why it's called grace. Verse eight, just in case the point is not crystal clear, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's where we are naturally. Ephesians 2. Paul tells what he was, what we were, what you might be. He tells us what what man is in and of himself. And you were, Ephesians 2, 1, dead, spiritually dead, you're physically alive, but you're spiritually dead, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He uses the past tense, he's writing to the believers at Ephesus, probably a circular letter for other churches in the area, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The natural man does one thing. He seeks to satisfy himself. Again, the important question when we look at human nature is not what are people doing. That becomes obvious. That plays out on the stage of life. The real question is why are they doing what they're doing? And when you peel back the layers of the onion, the unbeliever, the natural man, is always going to do what he thinks, she thinks, is going to satisfy themselves. Everything, the world revolves around self when you're the natural man. The sun, the star, you think it's all about you. And it's only until the Lord saves you that you begin to realize, oh, it's not about me. It's about him. But everything that a person does is ultimately for self-gratification. Even if it's helping somebody else, it's because what they get from it. Does that make sense? That's what motivates people. And we, we have to understand human nature. Titus 3. Titus was hiding on me. All right. Titus 3, 3. Paul writes to Titus. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, that's what man is naturally. That, 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 that describes the whole of humanity save the Lord Jesus Christ. But, verse four, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for man to, mankind appeared, 
He saved us. Who is the one acting upon the believer that they might believe? God is. It's the divine initiative. He is always, Paul goes to to Thessalonica. There's not a church, there's not a synagogue. He goes to preach to the women and it says, and the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive the word spoken by Paul. Salvation is of the Lord. Look what he says, he, capital H, he saved us, why? Not on a basis of deeds we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy and by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. He has to change us to make us spiritually attuned to what he's doing spiritually. The reason that this book is different to the believer than any other book that's ever been written, it's white pages, black marks, maybe red marks. The thing that makes this different than War and Peace, than Pride and Prejudice, any great literature work, is that this book is spiritual. It's the word of God. It's living and active. And if you have the Spirit of God within you, if you've been sealed by the Spirit, this resonates with your soul. It's like a tuning fork. We hear something that was written thousands of years ago, and it's almost as if the Lord is staring a hole in our soul. That's what's different about this book. But if you don't have the Spirit of God, it's black marks on white pieces of paper. Verse, so he says, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he, the Father, (coughs) poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, i.e. the gift of God, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God is the author of salvation. In case, in case we are having a hard time with that point, go back to John 6. Okay. Okay. It, the, there's a black Tahoe parked at the green elephant next door and it's license plate BDM5383. The owner next door is about to tow that vehicle. If you have that vehicle, I think we found the owner of the vehicle. (laughs) All right, John six, total inability, total depravity. Who is the author of salvation? I knew I didn't have a child in the nursery. I didn't know what the note was gonna say. John 6, verse 44. Who is the author of salvation? What is man's ability to turn himself to God? The Lord Jesus Christ says in John 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You have to be drawn by God in love, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 65, John 6, 65. And he, Christ, was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. If you have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's because the Father has drawn you. He elected you before time began. Your name was, he loved you before the foundations of the world, see Ephesians 1. And at the right time, he sent someone with God's word, with the gospel, 
He renewed your heart. He, the Spirit is coming alongside, and he has given you the ability to receive that. He has drawn you with cords of love. I love this end. This is the Galilean road tour. There's thousands, 10,000 people. I say that tongue in cheek. This is, there's, Christ has said words and nobody can stand the words. And it says in verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Jesus said, therefore, to the 12, the apostles, those that he's chosen, do you, you don't want to go away also, do you? It's almost like he's looking at them. You can almost see this scene and going, okay, now's your chance. I'm being sarcastic. Everybody else has left. The 15,000 is now 13. There's me and the 12 of you. This is what the person who the Lord has chosen says. Simon Peter answered Christ, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Once the Lord saves you, there is no going backwards. You're not going back to that old life. You can try, but everything has changed. Peter's going, where are we gonna go? Verse 69, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You have changed us. We're not leaving. We're going to the end. Jesus answered, verse 70, did I myself not choose you? Did I myself not choose you? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's because God has chosen you. People come up and say, well, I, I don't, we all have doubt. We all have problems with assurance. We go through seasons of we're, we're not walking the way we should. Am I really God's choice? Am I really what you call the elect of God? Did God really choose me before the foundation of the world? It's real simple. What do the chosen of God, what do the elect of God, what do the beloved of God do? They believe. They believe. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ and Son of God and in him and him alone you have the saving of your soul? Paragraph four. Justification and sanctification. Man has been called from his state of total inability, total depravity, into being righteous, justification, being declared righteous with God. When God converts a sinner and translates or brings him into a state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin, and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so also that by reason of his remaining corruptions, sin, he does not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but does also will that which is evil. So now the person has come to faith. You have a body of sin, you have a body of flesh, and you have a new man residing within you. And at this point, you now have truly the freedom in your will to serve God or to serve yourself. And there is this battle royale going on between your ears it's a battle of your mind on whether you're gonna do what you wanna do or what God wants you to do. But it is only at this point when God has sealed you with his spirit that you have the ability to fulfill the good works 
that God has prepared beforehand that you could even walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. This is, and I'm not gonna, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. This is what we're gonna read in Romans 7. This is where Paul is. Paul says, the very thing that I wish to do, I cannot do, and I do the very thing that I wish not to do. Here's the, here's, let, me, let me put it on the bottom shelf. You are not, as a believer, going to execute God's will in your life very well at times. You're not. And you're gonna mourn and cry and beg the Lord for what you have done and ask that he will increase your faith. But if the desire is in your heart and your mind, if your mind truly wishes, even though you can't execute it, to follow God, if the wishing is present, that tells you everything of where you are. Does that make sense? All right, let's go through a couple verses. Since we're in John, I'm in John. Go to John 8, 34. <coughs> He's having a conversation with the Jews who do not believe. They're claiming Abraham as their father. Jesus is saying basically so. Verse 34, John 8, 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin and the sin, the, I'm sorry, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son does remain forever. If therefore the son, i.e. Christ, shall make you free, he's talking about spiritually free, you shall be free indeed. Those that's life that's characterized by sin, we, there, there's two masters in this world. There's sin and there's the Lord Jesus Christ you fall in one of those camps. You're either a slave to what you wanna do or you're a slave to the one who paid with his blood for your life, Christ. Let's go to Philippians 2. The point is in verse 13. The context is verse 12. Paul writes, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's a command, literally we would almost say it's, it's a present imperative, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean earn it. That means live it out. That means if God has made you a good tree, produce good fruit. This is very much what James writes in James 2, starting in verse 14. Faith has to have works. Faith that is true faith produces something, okay? J James 2, 14. Work out your salvation for, with fear and trembling, and here's the point. What is the energy behind that? It's divine energy, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is, this is Ephesians 2, 10. Your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he's prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. God has done the work, we're to fulfill it. I, I mentioned it, I'll read it, Romans 7. <clears throat> the battle royale between the two natures that man has, the sin nature 
and the life in Christ. Paul writes in verse 15, for that which I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing that I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So, no, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. Is that where you're at? That's where you should be at. That should be, this is the struggle after justification of progressive sanctification. This is the battle that the Christian lives. This is the zip code, the neighborhood, and the street that we live in every day of our life. There is this battle going on. Am I gonna do what I wanna do? Or am I gonna do what my master wants me to do? And, And I wanna make sure the reason we do what the master wants us to do is because we know that he has loved us more than we can even love ourselves. We are motivated to serve the Lord Jesus Christ because of his love for us. It's what compels us. We see what he's done for us. This is not drudgery. This is not forced obedience. We're wanting to love the one who loved us. Okay? Glory. Paragraph five. There will be a day when we will not be in this struggle. There will be a day when we're in the presence of God, when there will be no spot, no wrinkle, there will be no tears, there will be no, there, there, there will not be this condition that we're in now. It's glory. This will of man is made perfect and immutably, unchangeably, free to own, to do good alone in the state of glory alone. There is no sin in heaven. We will be changed. And really the verse, I think the best verse for this is in 1 John. 1 John 3. And this is where I'm going to stop. And if somebody has a question, I will answer a question and then we'll pray. 1 John 3. 1 John 3, verse two. Beloved, fellow believers, John writes, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. For we know that when he, Christ, appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is we will be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect one, the holy one, the one who never sinned. The Lord Lord can accept sin in heaven. He will change us into into the likeness of our Savior for his glory. Anybody have a question about the will of man? What do you say to the person who says, God draws everyone, but man says no, right? So go back to to what we understand about God. God is sovereign. Everything that he does is effectual. All those that he selected, elected, chose, loved before time, that entire subset of humanity to the very single number 
will be in heaven. There will not be one more, and there will not be one less. And so if God draws you, and if Christ died for you, it is effective. Man, so in the, without, this is a different topic, in TULIP, if you know what TULIP means, it's total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, and the I is irresistible grace. There is no one who will stand at the end of the age who says, God drew me, but I refused. Can't happen. Answer the question? Okay. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful words. We thank you that you are the God of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you draw your people with cords of love. Lord, that it's effective, that you sent your son to die for the people that you have given him. And Lord, to the praise of your glory, we can say amen. We can say thank you. We didn't deserve it. We didn't have any part of it. But Lord, you drew us. And Lord, we will be with you in heaven worshiping you forever. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that is your child who does not know that they're your child, that if today is according to your will, that today would be the day that you would open their eyes, that you would give them the, the gift of faith, that you would regenerate the heart, that they would sing your praises. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen.